Good afternoon, everyone. Hey, thank you so much. And you're right, it is bright. Um, thank you guys to the advisory board for allowing us to talk about lessons learned with repeat clickers. And what's a repeat clicker? I mean, by the way, Erica, you stole my line, happy clickers, that's what we call them. They're, they're natural curiosity sort of takes over. And in our company, that's basically five or more you know, clicks, uh, simulations at over time period, right, is what we define as a repeat clicker. When we were putting this presentation together though, we sort of talked about what is the problem we're trying to solve. And yes, it is reducing that number of folks who do that because it does reduce the risk. But the other part of the problem was you're never going to have zero repeat because everybody's abilities are different. So the other issue is how do we lean in and meet them where they're at? And if I think there's a theme to this summit this year, it's definitely empathy. I've been hearing it now and throughout several different talks. Um, so that's where we come in is how do we really find out what their challenges are and help them? And how do we overcome that curse of knowledge that we all have in whatever job we do, we know something, they don't know it, we don't understand why they don't know it, and we don't really kind of get out of our own way, right? So before we get into a story we're gonna tell you, you need a little context of who we are. So if this image doesn't tell you kind of where we're at, <laughs> um, and the word Edison in our title, uh, we are the one of the largest power only utilities. We power over 15 million customers across uh, central, southern and coastal California. Um, this makes us part of critical infrastructure, right? We have about 28,000 team members, which are roughly 50-50 of employees and supplemental workers. Because a lot of our field, a lot of our IT are supplemental workers. So what that does is, is there one more click? Yes. Sorry. See if that comes up. The one graph didn't come uh, up. The graph didn't come up. It's okay, up all right, today. we're gonna we're gonna roll with it. So what that makes this is a target. We are definitely a large target. We had over 453 million unauthorized access attempts to our outer network last year. And there is a graph on this slide that's called our onion graph. Um, it sort of gives that visual. Now this is anything we realize from the bots pinging our network to the malicious attacks. But it's just to give you that understanding that it's this constant barrage, right? And I'm sure all of you have similar stats or some kinds of stats like this. Now, 99% of those are blocked, which is great, but we still had 580 user penetrations, which about 70% of those are phishing and another 30% are investigations and other things that the CSOC has to look into. Where we get concerned is vendor compromise. Vendor compromise. So in 2022, we saw 44 of those. But last year we saw 96, and our ops team tells us we're on path to do more than that this year. Because Edison is hard and crunchy on the outside. We got layers and layers and layers of tools. But the city of you know, San Dimas that we, work, that we support, or the um, schools that we support, or whatever, they don't have that kind of defense layers. So it's easier to go after them then grab the Edison emails and then go after us. And so we do a lot of training with our employees on if you have any second guess on that, you, you contact us, you know, or contact your vendor, contact them by phone, by a separate email, but double check it because that's the area that I think concerns us. So like I said, just to say we, we have an attack vector and this is all leading to this next slide, which is the decision that we that the uh, leaders made in 2021. Oh. Now it comes up. There it comes up. <laughs> At the end. It's a laid reaction on the slide. Okay. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about something we know is a controversial topic in this room and around the globe. Um, but our leadership determined that there was too much risk at stake uh, to not have some kind of consequences in place for phishing. So, it, and as security awareness professionals, you know, sometimes we have to implement things that aren't necessarily 
would be our decision and our hope to not do, but you have to do it. Um, we have to keep people vigilant on this case. So Martin's gonna talk a little bit about what the program is, but what we do wanna just mention is, if you're a company that makes toys or candles or something that's nice to have that's useful, but it's not necessarily necessary, <laughs> You get breached, you have a bad day at the company, your customers have a bad day, your stock market you know, has a bad day. If we get breached, hospitals and banks and schools and everybody else has a bad day. So that's why they had to take the actions they did. Yeah, and so with the corrective action guidelines, we do fish every single month, but only four simulations are tied to this program here. Um, some of the incentives, one, it's tied to our bonus, right? Everyone likes a little bit more money in their check. And two, potential consequences. Uh, just to level set, if somebody clicks on a link, uh, or I'm sorry, on a simulation four times that's tied to corrective actions, uh, that means um, disciplinary action up to termination. And then the metrics for this program really comes down to the overall click rate and report rate that is determined by our leadership and that'll tell us whether we're successful or not. So this is where our story begins. We're gonna talk about one particular employee and his journey through fishing in our environment. And Martin, yeah. Fishing. Okay, so um, again, one man's journey and experience in the world of fishing. I'm gonna to refer to a real individual by the name of Tony. Let's learn a little more about him. So Tony has been working at Southern California Edison for 30 plus years. I mean, this is a long time. I think really impressive just to be at one company alone for this long. He, overall, Tony is also a very great employee. If we were to look in his personnel files, we would find nothing negative, nothing but great performance appraisals by his leaders over the years. Again, a, a value to the company. Tony also lives in the world of engineering. So he's used to looking at schematics, blueprints. He's held various job titles from engineer one to lead engineer, supervisory engineer, engineer project manager. I mean, I think the guy's probably done it all. Very successful in the engineering space. Tony is also in his mid to late 60s meaning he's probably close to retirement. I think it's safe to say that he expects to end his career with Edison, you know, now that he's with the company for 30 plus years. Now, in addition to this, Tony has been very stressed out over the last several years. Why? Because there's been a lot of organizational changes, uh, peers being shuffled to different groups, projects being taken away, projects being given. And now um, Tony is expected to to uh, do a lot more and produce more results with less resources. Something maybe I think we've all experienced uh, at one point in our career. Now, on top of all this, the frustration, Tony is also not computer proficient, and that includes emails. I had a conversation with Tony at one point, and he mentioned how when he grew up going to school and even for engineering, not once did he interact with a computer. There was just calculators. A little hard to imagine, right, in today's world. You know, Tony's not looking at emails very carefully. He's not living in the cyber world like you and I are for a living. Um, you know, he's not check, double checking who sent it or checking the links. No, he lives and breathes engineering. Now we mentioned the fishing program, how it's here. Corrective, act Corrective Actions is now here. It's 2021, right? And so now at this point for Tony, it's sink or swim. Let's see how he performed the last couple years. So in 2021, Tony had a 50% click rate. Not that great, failed six out of the 12. In 2022, a little better, but still not that great. 36% click rate. And so Tony originally was not on our radar, but because he clicked so many times the last couple of years, he's now identified as a repeat clicker. 
uh, to the cyber organization, right? And we've already identified uh, or defined what that means, somebody that just clicks on quite a few emails. And so if you remember on the corrective actions, this is really not good for Tony because four clicks that are tied to corrective actions means potential termination. Tony is now in deep waters. All right, so the big question, what happened to Tony? 30 plus years with the company, you know, he's been loyal to SCE. Is this it? The company that, that uh, he gave his life to is gonna kick him out? Well, because of Tony's stellar performance over the last 30 plus years, the expertise that he has, the value that he's brought to the company, HR, leadership, um, as well as legal, have decided to not terminate his employment at SEE. Whew. But this caused a little chain reaction. You know, that means these guidelines now have to be revised. And so we, cybersecurity, had to partner with HR to revise them. And here's the refresh version. A couple things that are noteworthy here. Uh, one, you'll see that it's now extended to five failures, right? So users get just another chance. But the, uh, another big thing here is we are now having conversations with users right at the beginning, whereas before we weren't even talking to them. Now this is spearheaded by the leader. Uh, we're having important conversations like, why'd you click? What do you think you could have did better? Is there any training resources that we could support you with? How can I support you through this program? Perhaps a Q&A session with cyber, right? We're trying to find out uh, where that gap lies and try to close that. Um, another thing to point out is uh, the user still has a one-on-one -on -one training session with myself on the third failure where I customize that training based on their needs. And our goal here, you know, as a cyber team here, our goal is for no one to lose their job over phishing. But it really takes a village of employees, it requires a leader to be involved, and it requires the user to want to help themselves and learn how to identify malicious uh, indicators on an email. And, and that village concept is real, you know? It, it's management, it's cyber awareness, it's coworkers, it's ambassadors. You know, those other folks other than management and, and awareness are not going to know somebody's individual stats, but knowing that they have a safe place to go for questions, some place that they can, you know, feel like I, I, I don't want to look stupid, but I really don't know if this is fish or not, right? So that we did put, put that surround Tony with it, and we do that now as a blueprint for anybody else. One caveat to all this is that these will not be changed again. For our CEO, it's five, and it's gonna stay at five. Now, some good news at SCE, a user can reset to zero as long as they go 12 full months without clicking on another simulation that's tied to corrective actions. And if you put yourself in Tony's shoes, you're not computer proficient, 12 months from the day you click just seems like a long time. I mean, this is a tough mountain to climb for Tony. But the way it started is uh, we first engaged the leader. We decided to empower the leader to be much more involved uh, with, with the user that is struggling. Uh, the way we did that, we met one-on-one -on -one with the leader. We trained them properly to have uh, good coaching sessions, how to identify malicious emails, indicators. We equipped them with a manager's toolkit. Uh, cyber FAQs so that they can feel very well prepared. And after that, Tony then had regular ongoing sessions uh, with his leader alone. Um, I mentioned the third, uh, third uh, click training with his, is with myself. Um, this session was super valuable uh, for Tony as it was for me because I got to learn about Tony's struggles and hardships that he was dealing with, with the organizational changes, and the fact that he is not familiar with computers, including email. But on the flip side of that, it was very valuable for, valuable for him as well as I got to show him, right, phishing 101, how to 
identify indicators, the external banner, let's hover on links, um, things like that. So again, very valuable session for both of us. So everybody, I'll talk more in detail on this on the next slide, but essentially my colleague, Yolanda Jones, who's probably back at the office watching this right now, she set up, she set up quarterly meetings with Tony uh, to check in to see how he's doing, if he had any questions, and that was very uh, good support system for Tony that, that he had, and he leveraged that quite a bit. He also felt a lot more confident with the training the cyber buddy and a tip that we gave them called external folder rule. Essentially, it's when an external email comes into your mailbox and you set up a rule that says anytime an external email comes in, it's gonna be routed to a separate folder. And that does two things for the user. One, it gives them peace of mind knowing that everything in their primary inbox in theory is safe. And two, when they have focus time, they're gonna be a lot more conscious going into that external folder knowing that they have to review and inspect every email carefully. So after a year of diligently using the tools that we gave to Tony and his leader, Tony was able to reset to zero on November 1st, 2023. Pretty wild. Yeah. Tony was the first individual, um, or when this happened, we knew uh, it was a little celebration in the office, right? Because we saw that he reported the last fish, the data collection closed, right? So that was a done deal. Um, smiles across the room, high fives in the office. Uh, Yolanda Jones actually sent Tony a personal email on behalf of cybersecurity saying, congratulations for resetting to zero and for all the hard work he's put in. Now, Tony was the first uh, user that was really at the doorsteps of termination for us. Um, so this was a huge learning curve for our team. Uh, one thing that we took away was if you um, just go the extra mile and add a personal touch on helping a handful of users, it can really make all the difference and reduce the risk that they initially posed. Um, I guess I'll also say that um, it's... It, it was uh, quite a journey for Tony, and um, he really appreciated the extra care that we provided to him. Um, anything else, Sue? Uh, no, I think you're going to solve it. Okay, I mentioned the Cyber Buddy program a little earlier. Um, and so, what is it? It's really that personal connection between the user and a cyber team member. And it, the, the purpose is to provide guidance, support, and confidence. Guidance, meaning we're providing step-by-step -step assistance uh, to the user. When they call us on the phone asking about a questionable email, we're not giving them answers right over the phone, no. Instead, we're trying to pull that information and the answer out of them by asking them questions. Have you checked the link? Uh, have you checked the sender? Does the domain seem to match? Is this something that we should report uh, to phishing? Uh, things like that. Support is where we're giving a little extra attention to those that really need it the most. And this is a two-way street. Uh, we're not just gonna completely continue to chase after users. Uh, we also expect uh, employees and supplemental workers to come to us as well. Now, my training sessions are 30 minutes. I like to do, do them quick, get them in there, get them out. Um, but there's been a handful of users, probably about three over the last year that really needed more of my time anywhere from one hour to about an hour and a half. Uh, two of these were a little bit on the elderly side. Uh, one of them was, was not, but again, it was super valuable for everyone, and I was really happy to help them out. Last one is confidence. We're celebrating small wins, like with Tony, right? Fist pumps in the air, right, when he resets to zero. We're also creating that safe space for users that are frustrated uh, to express their frustration, uh, their concerns, their questions, I personally love to um, help them ask the hard questions because they always seem a little hesitant, like they don't want to offend us. Um, and so one guy was really comfortable finally, and he was like, well, if cyber is in the company, why do we even have to learn all this? Because you guys should be stopping everything. We shouldn't be doing anything. And you know, uh, I had to answer that. And the, the answer is, right, tools don't work 100% of the time. 
It's like 99.8%. And when you tell them the truth, they get it. They start to you know, feel a little bit more relaxed and, and they understand the bigger picture and how they need to be uh, involved. Okay, so you've now gone through Tony's journey. And actually, I think what we can also share is that Tony has decided to retire at the end of yes. the year. Um, he and can retire on his own merits without worrying about going out on a on a whimper rather than a bang, right? Yep. Um, and to that point of the tools, I mean, even our chief security officer would love it if employees never had to worry about this, right? That our tools caught absolutely everything. Um, but he, as he said, he's said that for 20 years and he hasn't been able to make it happen. So that's a reason we're all still here, right? So what other tactics do we do that are either to do that proactive measure or even after the, the clicks have happened? So we do something called an annual fishing derby. And I know there are some folks in this room that probably also do their versions of this. Um, it's a competition. It's an opt-in competition. We do it for a month. We do it in May. During that time, we totally get rid of our regular fishing program, so there's no co confusion. Uh, and in the past, it's only been just volunteer, you join it, right? And it still is. But this year, we made the decision that if anybody had missed one of our uh, corporate goal simulations, those four that we talked about being important that tied to corrective actions, we auto-enrolled them into the Derby. And they were told, their managers were told, if they chose not to play along, that's fine. They still were gonna see the simulations and there was no consequences. And we base our, our, our simulations for the Derby on our harder simulations so that they have a chance to practice. And they earn points for reporting, they lose points for clicking. If it's an easier simulation, they lose more. If it's a harder, they lose less. It all kind of weighs itself out. And at the very end, we had a, we, this year we had 6,000 players. And at the very end, we had about 300 with perfect scores. They go into a one week speed round, which is the way to determine our top 10 winners. And those are like three simulations and it's based on how fast you reported them. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. Talk to us later if you wanna learn about derbies. Um, the other thing is custom one-on-one -on -one training, which is really where our training lead uh, and guru over here gets involved. If we know what their knowledge gaps are, we'll try to, you know, have that time with them or create something for them that is really based on what those knowledge gaps uh, are that they need to take care of. Um, the other thing when we talk about derbies, we love this. We had managers reach out to us a year or so ago. Hey, I, you know, we have something called, I should back up one second. We have something called Fish Tracker for our managers, which is gonna also be available to our employees pretty soon. Um, and it's on our Power BI uh, dashboard. And it's where managers can track their team's you know, performance. How are they doing in regards to fishing? Um, so we had a couple managers who wanted to compete with each other because they could see some of their teams weren't you know, performing to what they wanted. So we created a mini derby that was like a couple weeks long. And then the winning department got a pizza party, right? So it's another way to just keep folks engaged. Um, the next one I want Martin to talk about because he created it. Yeah, Fishing 101, <laughs> this gives us an opportunity to present training challenges to the enterprise. For example, identifying the domain in a complex URL. Or how about if we receive an internal email that's marked external, right? Is that something we should trust or not? Um, we're not just focused on training our employees, but also the supplementary workforce that we have. On an annual basis, we send out emails and written letters or letters and communications to these agencies, letting them know of the guidelines, reminding them of the expectations that we have for all of the supplemental workforce that's at Edison. Yeah, and I will add, because the question might come up, you know, how does corrective actions work with supplemental? It's actually four and the assignment is terminated. And it's a pretty hard uh, decision at that point. So supplementals are very much involved in this. Um, so. The one thing that we really want to acknowledge is that not all teams are built the same. Um, when this program at Edison started, it was uh, a couple of employees who had additional work that they did in cyber, whether it was for regulated, uh, you know, NERC SIP, things like that. 
um, but they wanted some kind of awareness and they needed to build training. And that was back in like 2008, it sort of started off. Very small. Um, eventually I got brought in to help with communications. And then over the last five years or so, with the help of our manager, Carla Romero, who's here today, and everybody go talk to Carla later. Um, it, we would be able to grow the team to where we are. And we are a team of seven. So I'm just gonna let you know, I was glad to see there are a few other teams that are growing as well. It does allow us to do some of this high touch, but there are ways to kind of extend your reach, your arms and legs, if you don't have that size of team. And the biggest one is if you can get your leadership to buy into this, leverage the managers. Okay? Have the managers be trained, be coached. We have a manager's toolkit that's on our portal that, you know, that has a FAQs, it has templates, it has uh, you know, their understanding of how to work with their employees when it came to phishing. And then we do presentations at all managers meetings, you know, we just, it's sort of like a train the trainer. You know, we want them taking some ownership of this. We have a lot of managers now who put phishing on the performance appraisal as a goal. So it, it even creates it that way. So use that. The other one is your ambassadors and champions. Why are folks ambassadors and champions? Because they got an interest in cyber. So arm them. We do something called a cyber tip of the week, which I know hopefully Mitchell's watching. He's Mitchell Villarreal does our cyber tip of the week. And it's essentially we follow news stories or we have trends or tips. Anything we feel is important to get out, we send them this uh, weekly email. And the very first thing it says is, please share this with your teams. And they do. And it's just to get that message going of, of whatever it is we need them to know. But it helps in the phishing arena because we'll do it for how to read a URL or you know, what's the proper things to do you know, in terms of external email. If a Microsoft Office SharePoint OneDrive is, you know, is, is a tagged external, here's why, right? So we can explain it to them. Um, we do a monthly newsletter called the Cyber Brief. Uh, again, email, it's, it's got a little more detail to it. And then our quarterly briefings to our ambassadors uh, gives them even more information. So use these folks and partner with your corp comm and your key stakeholders, your, your data privacy, your information governance, whatever teams you can to leverage their channels and they can leverage you and work together. So lastly, we're gonna end on a quote that I found that I think sums it up better than I ever could. And that's, what is empathy? It's extremely powerful to hear someone say, I get you, I understand, I see why you feel this way. This kind of empathy disarms us. So in our world, what does empathy look like? It's filling in those knowledge gaps that people have. It's giving them confidence. It's nurturing trust that they have a safe place to come. They know who to ask for questions. And if we just help one person at a time, that's one less risk in the company. So I think with that, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions and I think we just have our last, our contact information on oh, yep. the slide. But thank you guys. Any questions in the room? Awesome. Sorry, we were turning my microphone on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue and Martin. One more round of applause. Yeah. All right. I already see some hands up in the audience. Oh, okay. I have my helper going that way, but we are going to start with one in Slack because I'm already going to give y'all a heads up. You got a lot of chatter in there, so you're going to want to go check that out after you're off the stage. But one theme that I am seeing is um, in regards to your one-on-one -on -one training, and I even had this question, where do you find the time? Um, a lot of us have teams that are just a one man or woman show. What does that time per month look like um, and how much you put towards that? Yeah, I would say it definitely comes in waves. Um, in Q1, it was around like 23 individuals that I had to do this four uh, 30 minute ses sessions each. Uh, this last wave in Q2, it was only about seven. So it'll fluctuate. I found what works for me is as soon as I get the green light to schedule this training, uh, I try to do it same day just to knock it out. Um, it just seems like it, it, it's been working out for me where I, I get them done very quickly. Um, 
Yeah, but yes, yeah, so it definitely feels draining like by the end of the, end of the week when you do this uh, quite a few times. Yeah, and I think I would just add that, like we said, we know when it's a small teams of one and two, you have to sort of right size what you can provide. Um, I know when we were much smaller, it was some phone calls, you know, just quick phone calls to help somebody as we could see the stats and we would only hone in on those that were really, you know, just clicking on everything, right? Uh, I'll, I'll also add that the one-on-one -on -one training is like really, they do appreciate it a lot because they get to just answer, you know, all the questions, right? We're an open book. Uh, mo most recently, last year, I included now a slide that talks about the underlying behaviors, which I think is really key, right? We can give someone all the tips and all the tricks, but if there might be an underlying behavior there that we have to try to uncover. So I help the user, well, I walk them through that. And uh, there's been some light bulb moments Right, because as we all know, it's, it's hard to change a habit. We went back there, but. Hey guys, Jeff from Diebold Nixdorf, and thank you very much, great presentation. We have a repeat clicker program as well. It's a little bit more stringent than yours. Here's my question, and I'm not trying to stump the stars. You are basing this on repeat clicks for simulated phishing. Have you considered, and do you have any advice on what do we do for the people clicking on the real ones? Because we actually have those stats available. And have you thought about modifying your program to include those people? Thank you. Um, I know Carla's just, just shaking her head over here that we that there are discussions um, about that. I don't think any decisions have been made yet. And I apologize, I don't have all the information on that. Um, but I know that that has been in conversation. Yeah, so I'm a little bit more closely tied to that. So we work with the CSOC team. They'll go ahead and let us know if there was a, uh, a real fish that was clicked on. Uh, uh, there's two passes this could take. It's either one, the click was permitted, or two, the click was blocked. Both have different consequences to it. Um, and then it's also reviewed by HR if there was any damage caused to the company. Fortunately, uh, there's no, nothing has happened. Everything has been blocked, uh, but it does result in um, uh, uh, training, uh, coaching, uh, coaching is done, uh, as well as a uh, leader is informed. Um, so it, it does follow a little bit more uh, of the current model that we have. And I have a question. So you were talking about Tony and how he is an email proficient. Um, and he's an engineer. I don't know if he's a field engineer or if he's someone who sits at a desk all day. And the reason I ask is because um, you're a big public utilities company and you have field workers and people who aren't on email all the time versus people who sit at desks. Are you fishing everyone or, and is everyone held to the same standard? Yeah, so everyone, that is has an active email in our directory is fished, whether you're out in the field or in the office, everyone gets it so it's a level playing field. Um, we do we have created role-based training for users that are specifically out in the field, so I, I think that's been really helpful. Uh, we, we have tried to look for you know, how can we help these individuals, and what we found is a lot of them are on cell phones, so we that's where we created um, a mobile role-based role -based training uh, on mobile security, and we've got a lot of positive feedback for that. Great. Yeah, and I think I'd add that, I mean, there were discussions at one time about, do the guys in the field, you know, climb in the poles, do they even need external email? Can we just turn that off? Um, but through a lot of leadership discussions and HR, you know, we they do need to receive, like our HR benefits program comes from an external source. So, you know, we, we they need to be able to have that. Um, but, you know, we do talk about alternatives if we need to do that. All righty, let's okay. do one more round of applause for Sue and Martin.